Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, sorry, I have a little scratchy voice, a conference voice is getting to me here. Um, this is a, a, a really awkward uh, <laughs> thing for, for both of us. Um, <laughs> I think it's probably going to be more awkward for David. But um, So um, they've asked us to talk a little bit about uh, David and, and his life outside the lab. But by way of introduction, although I know many of you uh, uh, probably know David, I, I would still think it's uh, appropriate to give a proper introduction. So David Funder is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. He received his PhD from Stanford in 1979. He's a world-renowned expert on personality judgment and the assessment of psychological situations. He's received nearly $2 million in grant funding for his research, and he's been cited more than 23,000 times, yielding an H index of 67. Um, I did not count up all of his publications, but uh, I did look at his CV, which uh, includes his fax number, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and it totals 40 pages in length. Uh, in 2017, he was the FPSP, Her it was elected to the FPSP Heritage Wall of Fame. In 2013, he received the Doctoral Dissertation Advisor Award from UC Riverside's Academic Senate. And in 2008, he received the Jack Block Award for Distinguished Contributions to Personality Psychology. So, welcome everyone and welcome David. So, um, a few years ago, I remember, and I don't remember who uh, decided this, but you and I were talking about what's the best part of a manuscript? What's the most interesting part? Is it the method? Is it the results? Maybe it's the discussions. And, and we were debating this, and some, I don't remember if it was your suggestion or mine, but somehow we agreed that the most interesting part of a manuscript was actually the acknowledgement section. Because that's where you find out all the juicy details about like who actually did the study mm -hmm. and who actually <laughs> did all the work. Did yeah. all the work and didn't <laughs> get any credit for it. Right. right. And so um, so if we think about this session, like if you think of your C V as sort of the paper, this little uh, interview here can be like the acknowledgement section, right? It's where we can get to all the juicy stuff that's really interesting. Well, I don't know how well, <laughs> we'll see about that. Okay. <laughs> So um, I want to start with some juicy stuff right away, or this is a you know, question a clinical psychologist might ask, or Freud might ask. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Well, I was born as a small <laughs> child. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, a, a little interest, uh, coincidental tidbit about my childhood is I grew up in Sacramento, and uh, about three blocks away from David Kemi, okay. who also at the time had a big bushy head of curly hair, as also I did at that time, but we never met in Sacramento. We didn't find it out until, until years later, so we were ships that passed in the night. But so, suburban Sacramento, <laughs> very white bread, <laughs> and not very ex exciting. The home for personality judgment. Yeah. Or where it's it, it, it originated from there. Somewhere. Right, right. right. So what, what about your parents? What did your parents do? My father was a civil servant in the state of California, um, ran a uh, sort of tax collection and refund agency, and sort of was, had a white collar job, but he never graduated, from, he never went to college. Um, my mother also never went to college, but they were both very intelligent people and, and encouraged me to do what I wanted to do academically. So. Okay, so, the, well, and, and then I wanna, I'm gonna get into college here in a minute, but mm. first I wanna ask about, um, Siblings. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have an older brother who looks exactly like me, except add another ten years, okay. and and uh, so I can only see wh where I'm going. <laughs> and uh, uh, a, uh, also older sister. Okay. So you're the youngest. I'm the youngest. Okay. They right. would say the spoiled youngest. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why they were so encouraging you to go. Yeah. You know, as a baby. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, tell us about high school. Uh, uh, high school, elementary school. Um, what was that like? When you like, what kind of a what kind of a student were you in high school? Oh, I school? oh I was an obsessive compulsive A student, just yeah and really? and, and yeah and a total nerd, and uh, uh, hung out in the uh, art in, with the artists in the art room. Not that I had any artistic talent at all. It's just they were the only ones who approached the nerdiness that that I had. And I was editor of my high school yearbook, which was a lot of fun, actually. And and otherwise, high school was hell, of course, it is, as it is for most of us. But okay. Well, th so did you work while you were in high school? I did. I, what I, was I worked at Lucky Supermarkets okay. a, a, as a grocer uh, for three and a half years. It was an excellent job. It was union. 
we got paid time and three quarters on Sundays and triple time on holidays and I, two weeks paid vacation every year as a part-time employee. Had all four wisdom teeth taken out at one point. The union not, o not, not only paid for that, but gave me two weeks off to recover and a subscription or a prescription for codeine that I was really sad when it ran out. <laughs> <laughs> Still remember that. Okay, so um, uh, as a teenager, teenager, what were you like, or what did, did you? I mean, you. That, I guess that's what you were doing. You were working at the supermarket. Yep, I'm going to school. Okay, all right. So I, I do want to jump into now uh, higher education. So you went to Sacramento State. Actually, first. I, I actually at first I went to American River Junior College, as uh, for my first mm -hmm. year, and then transferred to Sacramento State for my second year, and then transferred from there to Berkeley. Okay, so compare. Sacramento State to Berkeley? You know what? The courses at Sacramento State were really excellent. I, I took a course, I, it, I, I think it actually has helped shape my career that I wanted to take a course in statistics. I didn't even know what statistics was, and all, but I thought it sounded like it could be useful. And all the ones in the psychology department were full. And all the ones in the, in the statistics department were full except for one that met Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. So I rolled in that and it was an Excellent, excellent course. He, it was all about probability distributions, binomial probabilities, uh, c uh, conjunct probabilities. It was all about that. No mention of significance testing until the very, very end, where he said, "Well, there's this kind of this kind of wacky thing you can do <laughs> with probabilities if you want. Some scientists actually do this." And I still remember I raised my hand when he explained the 05 level. I said, "Does that mean five percent of these studies are wrong?" And he looked at me and he said, "It's not that simple." <laughs> <laughs> And, and he didn't go on, but that little nugget that it's not that simple stuck in my head all these years, and I w I'm still grateful that that little seed of doubt uh, was, was, was implanted then because by, by an actual statistician, not a, not a psychologist. Now, who, who did you interact with would you, I mean, when you were in in, at Berkeley, for example? Well, the most important person I interact with, well, there was a guy named Bob Olton who didn't get tenure and probably because I ran his experiments for him, who <laughs> hired me as a, as a research assistant, really nice guy. He actually made me feel like a part of the department uh, in, in a concrete way. But the person, of course, the famous person I interacted with was Jack Bloch. Um, I took an undergraduate seminar from him. It was a senior seminar when I was a junior. Uh, I just lied about my age. I just said I was a, you couldn't do that now, right? Because it was on a piece of paper and nobody checked. Now it would be computerized, you wouldn't be allowed in. So by the time they discovered I shouldn't be in there, it was like four weeks into the quarter and <laughs> they let me stay. And Jack Block was sort of like what Brent Roberts was saying yesterday, spent this undergraduate seminar demolishing Walter Mischel's personality and assessment book. But at some point I said something in class and he looked at me and he said, that could be a topic for a senior thesis. And I thought, that's a, okay. So I did my undergraduate honors thesis with Jack Block, and very possibly I'm the only person who ever did an undergraduate honors thesis with Jack Block, because everybody was too afraid of him, and I was too dumb to really be afraid of him. So <laughs> he, was, he was always gruff, short, but nice to me. Mm. So, you know, can't complain. Well, now, uh, well, okay, so, so that, w but you mentioned you took a stats class, and you were really interested in statistics, but what got you into psychology? I just kept finding myself, t it was a uh, self-perception theory for, you know, v v very uh, Daryl Bem. I found that all the courses I wanted to take were psychology courses. I actually enrolled at Berkeley as a political science major. And every quarter you had to have this person sign off on your study list. And she looked at me one time and says, it says here you're a political science major. Don't you think you should take some courses in political science? <laughs> and, and I said, I don't want to. I want to take psychology courses. So, so I just kind of slid in. in in a backwards way when I discovered that I really loved those courses. Okay. Okay. So um, at some point along the way you're there, you decided you want to get your PhD. What, what was that? Was there a certain moment or did you just sort of always know it? I, it the, 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 yeah, the, the path of a professor never occurred to me. It wasn't on my, parent, my parents' radar screen. I, I was thinking maybe probably lawyer. That was what I had in mind with the political science thing, but not because I really wanted to do that. It was just like it's an occupation that's that's out there. And then at some point it dawned on me, well actually I was talking to Jack Block, that I realized that was his job. Like he was at work. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said, you can get paid for doing that. You know, that, that's amazing. So I decided I wanted to do that. It didn't look like working at Lucky at all. So, so it was from watching Jack. 
Well, and, and the other faculty members, but it was really, it, it was, I do remember chatting with Jack one day and just kind of going, he's actually, <laughs> good job doing this. <laughs> okay. So, so you left Berkeley and went to Stanford for your graduate work. Um, what was Stanford like at the time? Stanford was, uh, one, it prided itself on being on the cutting edge. And one of my f fellow graduate students so one day said, it's bloody out here on the cutting edge. <laughs> 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 um, it, it, was, uh, it was a very stimulating place and I could go on all day, but, but one of the things I, I will be grateful always to Stanford about is there was this impatience with, with the trivial. That anything you do was expected to be important. And of course that's very intimidating. Uh -huh. But it also does raise your sights in a way that wh where you're kind of going, it, it, it does kind of force your, your outlook onto the big picture of, of what kind of impact you could make and why what you're doing should matter in any kind of way. Gotcha. Switch pages here. So when you were at Stanford, um, I know you worked. Well, so you worked with Jack at Berkeley, and, and at Stanford you worked with Daryl. What? How did you? How did you meet Daryl? How did you decide to work with him? I mean, were you recruited by him? How did that work? Apparently, I was, but I was too dumb to know it. Again, I was so naive. I had no idea how this stuff worked. I had been there for a couple of weeks, and people kept saying, "You know, Daryl Bam keeps, keeps saying you should go talk to him." Like, I should? Why? Well, because he assumed I was going to be, he actually recruited me because he wanted to learn about the Q sort to help him study handwriting, which is a long story in itself. And I had never seen a Q sort. I knew nothing about it. But since I had been recommended by Jack Block, he assumed I did. Fortunately, Berkeley wasn't very far away, so I was able to go back and, and catch up on, on that training. So working with Daryl Bam uh, was extremely stimulating, extremely brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, one day we sat we stood in his office, we I was in his office and we were trying to uh, figure out what the best way to compare two QSORT profiles would be. And we invented the Pearson correlation coefficient from scratch. We decided the average of the cross product disease scores would be a really useful number. <laughs> and then uh, the following Monday, that was a Friday, the following Monday in, in our grad stats class, they explained that the Pearson correlation is the average of the cross product of the z-scores. <laughs> so I, that's why I went back to Daryl and said, well, I got some good news and some bad news. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> it's a really useful number, but you know, Pearson beat us to it by 85 years. So. <laughs> but I have understood the correlation coefficient uh, since. And he didn't exactly, he wasn't exactly a mentor so much as I was his right hand. Because the only way he could get research done was by talking to me. Hmm. He wasn't going to run subjects or anything. I'll, if you ever did that, probably years ago he did. So I met with him all the time. People say, how come Daryl gives you so much time? Like, no, you don't understand. He's giving me instructions. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, I learned a tremendous amount uh, from, that, from that experience. So you finish at Stanford, and you get your first academic job as at Harvey Mudd College. Um, Tell us about what Harvey Mudd was like. I, I feel kind of guilty that I was so ungrateful to Harvey Mudd College. I had never heard of it. Um, I, I was disappointed to not get into an, uh, an R1 job, mm -hmm. so I was kind of grumpy about that. Um, they kind of hired me kind of randomly. They didn't know how to hire a psychologist, so I didn't give a job talk or that kind of stuff. I just talked to the chair for a while. He liked me, so I got hired. Um, I have since discovered that Harvey Mudd College is a really cool place. It's kind of an awesome mini version of Caltech, except the kids are even smarter and, you know, awesome institution. And I, anyway, but, but so I taught uh, psychology there. I also got asked the, my favorite question I've ever been asked by an undergraduate there. I was lecturing on Freud, actually, to this room full of mostly engineers. I, if you don't know Harvey Mudd College, it's, it's the only majors it has are em engineering, chemistry, physics, and math. And they were thinking about bringing in biology, but biology is kind of soft and, and <laughs> flaky for them. I don't think they ever did, actually. I, I, and it was mostly engineers. And uh, I, I was lecturing about Freud, and I mentioned the concept of psychic energy. And suddenly they perked up, and one went, psychic energy? He said, in what units is that measured? <laughs> <laughs> so what did you tell them? I said, it's a metaphor. And they all went, ugh. <laughs> 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 That's funny. So, okay, so while you're at Harvey Mudd, that's when you met Patty. Yes. Okay, so how did you meet? We met at Tinder a- or? At, no, that did not <laughs> exist. I met the old fashioned way in person at a party 
uh, at my house as she had been invited by one of my housemates who had a crush on her. But things went a little <laughs> unplanned direction after that. Okay, so I think if I recall, you have a famous story about your first, maybe it wasn't your first date. It wasn't like first date. date. It was an early date. Um, we were out to dinner in a little tiny Mexican restaurant and uh, I was teaching Freud at the time. And one of the things, self-perception theory would, would predict this, of course, that when you teach it, I'd always try to teach it as an advocate. I never, I, I hate the style where you go like, another thing Freud said that was wrong was, you know, everybody hates that. Uh, at free, at least students hate that for good reason. So I teach it as an advocate. So I, it turned me into a Freudian temporarily. So I'm analyzing everything I see. And, and so she said something at, at dinner that I said, you know, the real reason you said that was blah, blah, blah. And she said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and for emphasis, gestured and knocked a glass of ice water into my lap, <laughs> which, <laughs> which had its own, I didn't interpret that uh, out loud. <laughs> but, but, but I did take the warning and, and learn not to do that anymore. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, you did. Uh, you were at Harvey Mudd for three years. Three years, uh, and then you jumped from Harvey Mudd to Harvard. Yeah. Uh, how does that happen? Uh, well, the 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 legitimate reason why it was possible to happen was I spent my summers in Berkeley in Jack Block's lab, and was able to get research done there and be stimulated all over again by Jack Block and the people around him and have access to his data set, and so I was able to publish stuff that I could not have been able to do had I just been at Harvey Mudd. The other reason is that I was trying to, I wanted, you know, I'm so ungrateful, I wanted out of there to go to an R1, and Harvard was at, advertised two jobs, one in social psychology and one in personality. Well, I was so ignorant at the time, I didn't know which one to apply for. So in my letter, I didn't say. And this was days of paper letter. And Judith Loftus, who was the sort of secretary to the department administrator at the time, remembers opening that letter and being really annoyed <laughs> that I didn't say which one I was applying for and there were two stacks by her window of applicants and there was the social psychology applicants and there was the personality applicants. <laughs> so she tossed mine into the shorter pile and the rest is, is history. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So um, you were at Harvard for four years. Four years. Okay, so tell us about some fond memories of Harvard. I really enjoyed being at Harvard. When I went there, uh, various people said, it's a snake pit, you're gonna hate it there, they're gonna be terrible, and they, it just was not true. They, they, they let me do whatever I wanted. I had some really great junior colleagues. Kathy McCartney, who some of you may know, came in at the exact same time, and we had a standing lunch date every Friday where we both unpacked the experiences we were having, like, where do they hide the stamps? Anyway, <laughs> you know, just all, all that kind of mundane stuff. Um, so. My fellow junior people there were a, a, a good support group, and it was actually a surprising upside of the fact that Harvard, at least at the time, pretty much had a policy of you don't get tenure as a junior person. So we all were kind of in the same boat, and that caused us to be a, a very, and we weren't competing with each other, you know, so, so it was a very mutually su uh, supportive uh, group that was a really important part of that, of that experience. So. Uh, four years at Harvard, and then oh, so well, actually, I'm sorry. I want to say what, what I think uh, oh, yeah, uh, sure. about Harvard, and then the senior people I, I interacted with yeah. um, was were Bob Rosenthal, who had uh -huh. his uh, office two doors away from me uh, d during during that period. One day, uh, I was uh, I just gave a presentation or something about comparing uh, judges of personality, uh, pe peer judges of personality. And I had used the uh, Pearson correlation coefficient, and he c very kindly drew me aside in the hall and explained to me why I should use the interclass correlation coefficient and taught me how to compute it, which in those days you had to do by doing a repeated measures analysis of variance on SPSS and getting the error terms off of that. That was the only way to do it. So I learned how to do that. And it also, by the way, when you do that, it gives you almost the exact same number as the Pearson correlation <laughs> coefficient. It never makes a difference. But it's the right thing to do. So. <laughs> So that's what I did. The other really interesting, per well, two other really interesting pe people. One was Roger Brown, just an interesting, brilliant, brilliant guy and a real sweetheart. Um, not the reverse of the, he and Bob both were like the reverse of the intimidating Harvard professor. They were both brilliant, um, but just nice people, easy to talk to, very friendly. And then David McClellan, who was a little more forbidding, 
but also just an absolutely brilliant guy. And his mind, man, meant just a handful of people I've ever met that I would put on that level. Maybe Jack Block, Daryl Ben, David McClelland are just not quite the same species as the rest of us. His mind went to all kinds of places that were distinct. Uh, well, that, I mean, uh, I've met Bob, but I never met David mm -hmm. McClelland. What was he like? He looked exactly like Buffalo Bill, for one thing. Okay. Had a, there was a picture on his office door of Buffalo Bill so that people could, could do the comparison. White hair, goatee, <laughs> kind of shaggy, uh, big guy. Um, I don't know what else to say. He was just a, a very interesting person who was very unorthodox, was always thinking outside the box, um, talked a lot, very interested in applications, although people never really realized that, that uh, tr trying to uh, decompose jobs into their component parts so that they could be trained individually. He, he hated the idea of aptitude testing. He loved the idea of skills testing. Mm -hmm. And he would talk for, he, I don't know if he's really known for that, but he really wanted to measure something so that we could find out what we needed to teach you to make you better at it. He did not want to measure something to peg you into a spot and say, well, that's as good as you're ever going to get. So I, I think, still think that's a pretty wise way to think about things. Yeah. Cool. So anything else before you want to talk about Harvard? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so you left Harvard for Illinois. Um, which I, I at the time was probably considered a pretty typical thing, but you were uh, you had more time you could have stayed at Harvard and you yeah left early it, it, it was basically an eight year position oh okay but when you get offered tenure uh, somewhere at a top ten university and you don't know if it's going to happen again you go okay. uh, but we had just decided with, that we really liked Boston and uh, you know it, and Harvard was kind of a fun place to be and I remember one day I was teaching an, uh, uh, at a classroom that was on the Harvard Yard in one of these Harvard brick buildings and it had snowed and I'm walking through the snow to go to class at Harvard I'm like this is so cool this is just a cool thing but um, but Illinois beckoned and uh, made me a, a, an offer and it's something that please don't hate on me too much for this but I never had to go through a tenure review process because they hired me with tenure so um, that was the other thing I was gonna say being, being a junior faculty member that knowing we didn't we weren't going to get tenure there meant that our outlook was always out there. Mm. It wasn't pleasing the people at Harvard. It was trying to make an impact on the field or do the kind of work that might get you hired by somebody else unknown at that time. So I think that was actually a healthy thing. And what was Illinois like compared to Harvard? Who did you interact with? I mean, we know it was a crummy area to be in. Well, Champaign-Urbana is a <laughs> nice place to raise your kids up. Sure. Um, our second child was born there. Um, I, I say that because I'm from there. That's why. I yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, it it it, it definitely has it has its advantages. Um, there was a, a a really impressive crew of people. Um, I co-taught personality psychology with Ed Diener and Jerry Clore, and they had rigged it so that the there was three se big sections of, of uh, the per undergraduate personality course, and the way they rigged it was that you would do one third of the course, all three sections, and then you were off the rest of the semester, and the next one you would do it. And actually, th they thought that was a great idea. I hated it because I, I discovered that my second lecture, you were given the three same lecture three times the same day. The second lecture was always better than the first one, and the third lecture was a disaster because I had no idea what I had already said. <laughs> and you know, I'd, I'd tell the same joke twice, or you know, they'd look at me like, boy, this, you're losing it up there. <laughs> <laughs> so so th that was really, but, but Diener, uh, Ed Diener and Jerry Clore are two of the nicest people you could ever hope to meet in the world, and very, very uh, kind to me and brilliant. Diener was just uh, starting his happiness research, and he admitted, <laughs> one of my first meetings with him, he said, well, I'm calling it subjective well-being because I really want to study happiness, but nobody will take it seriously if I call it happiness, so I have to call it subjective well-being. And one of the interesting changes in that field is that they can use the word happiness now. There's a journal of happiness studies, and that, that word has been destigmatized as a research area, but it was Ed Diener who did that by starting off with something that he very self-consciously used to avoid the word happiness, and then of course assembled, uh, sparked a whole research tradition. There's a happiness journal, there's happiness conferences. It's become a big thing, but it was just getting started when I was there. So, but you weren't in Illinois for very long. 
Yeah, three years. Yeah. And then you headed for Riverside. What yeah. made you decide to do that? Uh, I mean, you said it was a top 10 institution. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, and my uh, department head at the time, Manny Donchin, who if you've ever met him, he was one of these big 10 force of nature department heads. Um, and he looked at me and he said, Riverside, I wouldn't stop for gas in Riverside. <laughs> But the following year, three other faculty left Illinois and went to Riverside. <laughs> so John Anderson, Barbara Tinsley, and uh, Ross Park. Uh, so we were like the little Illinois contingent. And at Riverside, we, we learned pretty quickly, but not quickly enough, that a really bad thing to say in a department meeting was, well, the way we did it at Illinois was, and like, <laughs> nobody, wanted, nobody wanted to hear that. But, but it was, it, it, uh, if Riverside hadn't been in California at the time, I probably wouldn't have, have gone. But um, it was, and I'm from California, it was a chance to go home, we had family there. And they, it, it's a University of California campus. And I also, after I went there, f Riverside was my fourth job in 10 years at, at a f a post PhD. And I assumed I would keep moving actually. That because every time I moved, I, you know, you get a raise, you go to a better place and so forth. And at, at Riverside, I, we sank down roots, we had our second child, and uh, actually she was born in Illinois, and I changed my ambition from moving to a better place to making the place I was in better, and worked really hard, I think, to do that in various kinds of ways, and that's actually been a really satisfying uh, part of my career, I think, is to just try to improve the research mm -hmm. and bring in good people, and I think we've done that to some extent. Well, I mean, one of the ways you made not just Riverside better, but the field better was by publishing your book, The Personality Puzzle, in 97. So, were you been at Riverside then, or was that? No, I, yeah, I was at Riverside. Okay. Um, I actually, it, and that's when it came out. It's, it's a long process. I still remember I signed the contract to do it a week before Clinton was elected for his first term. Okay. Uh, no, I, so, that would be 1992, right? So, it came out in, in 97. The inspiration for that book, it was kind of I was poking around in the back of my mind for actually quite a while, was when I was at Sacramento State, I took a course in social psychology, and the textbook was Elliot Aronson's The Social Animal, mm -hmm. which was a very unusual book. Of course, at the time, I didn't realize how unusual it was. It was if you, some of you, I'm sure a lot of you know that book. It was paperback, for one thing. It had no pictures, or almost no, none. It wasn't one of these, you know, coffee table books like, you know, that most textbooks, and sadly including mine, now are. But it, I think that's what turned me into a psych major, was reading that book. It was just so vivid, it was so exciting, it was so uh, good at tying empirical research you could do to what it actually means and what the implications are. Brilliant writing, just one of the top 10, I'm sure, books ever written in psychology what was, that, was that textbook. And, my, and then I realized it's, Personality books had a way of being really boring. Um, uh, that's still true in some cases. Um, <laughs> you know, they, 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 uh, so I thought, why isn't there a personality puzzle? I mean, why isn't there a social animal type book for personality? And I thought, well, if that's ever going to exist, maybe I'd have to be the one to write it. So, but, my, and then there was, uh, for, <laughs> for complicated reasons, as my publisher, uh, the editor for Norton, named Don Fusting, was started pursuing me to do a textbook because he was told by somebody who told somebody. That's how editors work. And we would go to meetings. He w I'd always meet up with him. He would take me out to dinner at the most expensive restaurant in town. We would talk for hours about everything except publishing because that was just like not his style. <laughs> so it was the softest sell in history. <laughs> and But I knew why he was there, right? So it was almost like a you know, whatever you think of priming, it was a priming manipulation <laughs> that, 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 was, that that was activated. And I did have this idea about writing the personality version of the social animal in there. And when it started to come to fruition, I realized, well, I, how would I do with anybody but, but Fusting and Norton? So if you, to those of you who have uh, in your historical collection the first edition of that book, you'll discover it is paperback, it has no pictures, and it's about the same size and weight exactly as the personality puzzle. Or as? I'm sorry, as, as, as the social, social animal, animal. As the social animal, yeah. And that, and that was on purpose, of course. And then, of course, there's this massive centripetal force in the textbook world 
that forces all textbooks to be like all other textbooks. And, and I've really fought it, and Norton's been really good about that, but nonetheless, they would say, you know, our travelers, this is actually a little cool thing about Norton, they don't call their salespeople uh, salespeople, they call them travelers. That's just a little <laughs> Norton insider thing. They're, they're kind of cool. So th their travelers come back and say, my students won't read a book that doesn't have pictures in it. So I said, look at John Grisham. His books don't have any <laughs> pictures in it. <laughs> and they said, you're not John Grisham. And I said, oh yeah, I made a good point and you made a better point. So, so, uh, so, so over time, it now looks a lot more like a regular textbook than it used to, but I have tried to keep the distinctive uh, voice in it that hopefully works for some people. So you mentioned your daughters. Mm -hmm. I want to jump back to them for a second. And I thought they were both born in Boston, but based on what you just said, that's incorrect. No, uh, yeah. No, the first one was born in Boston and the second one in uh, Illinois. Um, Morgan uh, in Boston, Amy in Illinois. Amy in Illinois, that's right. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, <laughs> and at, at, I've been telling this anecdote lately because I've been thinking about statistics and probability theory and stuff. This is a true story that maybe this audience would appreciate. Uh, Morgan was in the process of being born and I was taking a break. Uh, her mother was not taking a break. <laughs> and, and I was wandering around the hospital and I, it very impressively, it was Brigham and Women's Hospital. Big, it's the big Harvard Medical School uh, obstetrics hospital. It's like the place on the planet for that. So very impressive. And I'm wandering around and I walk past a doctor in his white coat who's on the phone. And as I walked by, I swear, I heard him say, I just talked to our statistician and he says it's P less than 0.05. I don't know. <laughs> so it's hard to imagine what they could have been talking about. Well, I, mean, I, I right. presume medical research and not this next patient, but I don't know. <laughs> good, 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 good point. So yeah, I don't know where I was going to go with that. So well, what do so they do now? Uh, okay, so I have vivid memory of when I came home uh, Thanksgiving break from Berkeley and told my parents that I was going to be a psychology major. And they and the rest of my family were absolutely horrified. <laughs> um, my sister said, so help me, if you ever psych me out, I will never speak to you again. <laughs> and my father said, of course, what kind of job can you get with that? And I was like, I don't know. You know I, I hadn't quite put it together that you could be a professor or something. And I, it wouldn't have sounded very realistic at the time anyway. And uh, so, you know, so that was my experience. So I encouraged my daughters to follow their dreams, and I overdid it. So, uh, <laughs> so, so one was one was a cinema major, w is a cinema major at San Francisco State, and the other was a theater major at uh, UC San Diego. The first one is is an artist. She's done book covers. She's done book covers for me. She's done books covers for Norton, but she also uh, uh, dog sits and uh, is working for the census right okay. now. So, so, so that's that's uh, Morgan and Amy with her theater degree, did a lot of uh, gigs in the San Diego area of uh, stage. Uh, sh first she thought she was gonna be an actress, and then she discovered her real sp uh, strength, I think, was in stage management. Mm -hmm. She understands actors, but, um, and they bond with her. So she's stage manager or, or assistant stage manager, which is the person backstage, and she was going gig to gig to gig at the Old Globe and various theaters. And then she just, for the last year, has got an actual full-time job in theater in Las Vegas, working for a show called, you should all go, called Atomic Saloon. It's at the Venetian. It is rated R plus. <laughs> <laughs> she's not in it, she's a stage manager. <laughs> <laughs> but I do go to this and I go, this is my daughter's day job. I mean, this is, this is, this is what, what she does for a living. But I mean, it, it turns out if you want to have a, a life in theater, uh, theater related stuff, one of the few places you can do that and have a career is Las Vegas, huh. of all places. So that's where she is. Okay, so daughters, and you also have had, had over the years, a, a number of dogs. <laughs> uh, how, how many dogs have you had? How many, how much time do we have? <laughs> okay. What, what is our ending time? We're good, I got it. it okay, we have all, all right. 11 minutes. Okay. Oh, well, okay, good, good, good. Um, yeah, well, poodles, basically. So we had a, a standard poodle, and then we had and then after it passed, my wife had to get two standard poodles. And I thought, I don't like the way this is going. Is that mean there's going to be four standard poodles? <laughs> standard poodles. But, but cur currently, we have two golden doodles. And they are 
much larger than they were supposed to be. Um, one is 95 pounds, the other is 85 pounds. Oh and and uh, they're really sweet and really dumb, um, but, but oh, they're, they're dogs. <laughs> and then we also have two cats. And by the way, it, when you have two cats and two dogs, it's a really good demonstration that brains are more important than brawn because the cats completely dominate the dogs. <laughs> you know, they, they just, if, the, if the cat is on the dog bed, the dog kind of goes, I guess I'll sleep over here on the, on the cold tile until the cat moves. <laughs> so um, switching topics completely. Um, you've been recognized in the past, as I mentioned earlier, as an outstanding mentor for graduate students. And I know you've given talks about that kind of thing at, at conferences like this before, but what's, what's your secret to that? I don't know if it's a secret, but well, the, the big secret is get really good students. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and listen when somebody uh, does what Ryan's undergraduate advisor did to me here in New Orleans, actually, at the Sheraton. It was a year of Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Actually, we were here right before that. Uh, John Gray cornered me in, in an elevator and said, I got this student named Ryan Sherman. He wants to come and be in your lab this summer. If you don't take him, you're an idiot. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay. So, 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 so sort of the, the, the rest is, is history. But get really great students, so no matter, you know, however you can. Um, and then two other things. One is um, uh, a weekly lab meeting that we, we meet rigidly, I mean, we religiously every week. I, every uh, meeting is anywhere between two and four hours, and sometimes we talk about all kinds of crazy stuff. But I, I, I almost never actually meet with my students one-on-one. -on -one. And it's not because I don't love them and don't want to, but it's kind of like I want everybody to hear what I'm saying to everybody else, in part so I don't have to repeat myself, but also in part so they just kind of know and work together and provide their own ideas. It just seems like a, a inefficient to take one of them off in my office and just talk to them when the others could profit both from hearing it and provide their own ideas to it. So uh, that's always been very important to me. And the other is I always try to end the lab meeting with everybody knowing what they're supposed to do before the next lab meeting so that there's always a structure so and a little bit of accountability. So by next week, you're going to do that, you're going to do that, you're going to do that, and that keeps the whole rhythm going. It also keeps me honest. You know, be, obviously, it gives me homework as well, mm -hmm. as well to do. So it's been a really a great way of, I think it helps them get stuff done, and it helps me pace myself. And I really, it's a model that works for me. It's not for everybody. When a student comes in and says, I'm interested in X, and I'd like to have you advise me, I kind of like, go away. I, I, that's not how I do it. I'm sorry. There are people that do that. But if you join, if you work with me, you join my lab, mm -hmm. and, and we work together on common projects. I always tell my students, we have these big, I, my style, I kind of inherited that from Jack Block, is to do these very large data sets uh, that are very rich and very expensive and time consuming to get. Usually they take about three years to gather the data. I try to get a lot of things on people, interviews, self-reports, peer reports, behavioral measures, outcome measures, uh, in one case, life history interview, all on 250 or so uh, participants. It's a huge data set. It usually takes about three years to gather it, and that's what I spent the grant money on over these years, and then usually at least twice that long to analyze it. So it's like three years of data gathering, six years, or th three years of data gathering, six years of, of data analysis. So it's a, a big project, and it's got a, always a central theme to it, but I always tell my students, your goal should be to find yourself somewhere in here. And there's going to be a piece of it that's going to be yours that you will take ownership on. You will be the first author of papers on that stuff. You know, I'll work with you on it. But, and if you can't, then we're, it's not going to work out for us. But, but if you can find yourself in here somewhere, then that will be your part of the project. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, again, jumping topics a little bit. In, in more recent years, you've become a big advocate for uh, open science, replicable psychological science. Um, what inspired you to get involved in this? Well, it started a couple of roots to it. One was I was actually trained in experimental social psychology. I'm not a real personality psychologist the way a lot of people. I'm just not. I wasn't trained in it. I wasn't socialized in it. I was socialized in experimental social psychology, two by two designs, experimental manipulations. That, that's what I, we were taught to do at Stanford and, of course, counterintuitive findings and all that stuff. I tried to do that in the early part of my career. None of my studies ever worked. <laughs> and I thought, or, or they worked in funny ways that I couldn't make sense of. Uh, I started doing more stuff that I didn't know at the time was personality psychology. I thought it was still social psychology. When I studied personality judgment, 
I thought in person perception, the most interesting question you could ask about a person perception is, is it accurate? And it turns out that's a question that for reasons I'll never understand, social psychologists sometimes are proud of having no interest in. Um, that actually came up in a talk yesterday. Um, that, that uh, well, I, w I won't get into that. <laughs> um, so that's, but it turned out that that was being pegged as, as personality psychology and it was, and it, things in that domain are robust. You know, the inner judge agreement is a robust phenomenon. It's not a, something that doesn't replicate. It, always happens, 100% of the time. Um, two people who know you well will agree about, to a significant degree, uh, uh, about what you are like. There are things that moderate that, that it actually replicates. There are some traits that are easier to judge than others, and people who are easier to judge than others. That, the, all that stuff is, 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 is uh, solid stuff. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what got you involved in? Oh, and replicability, so, yeah, so, sorry. So I, I went off a, a different direction. So That's never so happened before. So, so yeah, right. <laughs> now, now you know how my lab meetings go. <laughs> so, but I had this sort of background of, of trying to do experiments that failed and then doing a different kind of research where things suddenly seemed to r really work almost easily. Not easily, but robustly. And then also the division, you know, the, what used to be the Division 8 cocktail hour and bars at SPSB when it, when it got going. People would sit around late at night and would often talk about studies that didn't work. You know, you know, I don't know what's wrong. I can't get this thing to work. I mean, what's going on? Oh my God, I had, uh, Brent Roberts has a very poignant story about a student of his who got really excited about a finding that was published in Science and wanted to follow up on it for a dissertation and wasted two years of her life before she discovered the finding doesn't replicate. It doesn't exist. Um, and I realized that these failed replicators were not shameless little bullies. They were fans of the research who couldn't make it work and thought there was something wrong with them. They all thought there was a failure in them. And they were told that, by the way. If they would go to the senior investigators who had found those things, that, that's what they're still told. Right? They said, if you can't replicate my finding, there's a problem with you. It's certainly not a problem with the finding. So, and, and so, so sort of a light dawned when I started to realize that maybe this is not just that people can't make this stuff work, and then a turning point for me was a conference that was held at the uh, European Association for Personality in 2012, which was uh, organized by Jens Assendorf. And Europeans aren't afraid to use word like expert. So they called this the ex an experts right, meeting, right, right that, that they sponsor. But that's where I first met Brian Nosek. And I had met Brent Roberts, but it was the first time I met the dark side of Brent Roberts. <laughs> um, the, the, the not exactly cynical, but we'll say very skeptical side of, uh, of Brett Roberts, and, and of course Jens is a, a really interesting, uh, smart guy. And we were talking about replicability issues, so that was specifically why that meeting was convened, and it really opened my eyes to a lot of the issues there, and Nosek had not done even that first wave of studies yet. He was thinking about it, but, but that's where it kind of got on my radar screen. And then a lot of things started happening that jibed with kind of my impressions that a lot of these findings that people couldn't get, it, the problem wasn't the investigator, the problem was the finding, that it just, it just wasn't there. And then I saw the backlash to it, and I'm kind of a, a reactive person, kind of like, I, I actually get motivated by things that strike me as wrong. So I got really, I, I still get motivated in accuracy research by the people who say, it's all the fundamental attribution error and all judgments are wrong, and that, that just motivates me to, to push back against that. And when I saw people pushing back against replicability efforts, that motivated me more to try to be a booster uh, of them because I think somebody needed to, to jump on that, on, on that uh, side of the, of the controversy. Okay. Well, we're coming up on our time here, but I want to do, um, yeah, I'm going to do one more question. We'll see. Okay. okay. So um, uh, many people here, faculty members, and you've been a faculty member for a long time, um, typically, uh, you know, you have your lecture in front of your students or whatever, but occasionally maybe you do something that was a little bit embarrassing. Um, and I just, could you share with us maybe an embarrassing moment you had in front of your students? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I do actually. I was talking about smoking in class, just like addiction, something about smoking cessation or something, some standard thing. And I just, and I used nonverbals and I went like this. Because <laughs> I've never smoked cigarettes, <laughs> but I have, okay. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's what I should have done. <laughs> but, I, but I did this, and they all burst out laughing <laughs> immediately. And I went, 
What's so funny? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So um, I think we're I think we're right on time. Great. So um, thank you th thank you all for coming. Uh, this uh, this was a treat. I hopefully we all got to learn uh, a little bit more about you. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs>